It was 10 and 30 seconds. 10 minutes remaining. No matter how hard you study, no matter if you have your trusty TI-89 titanium with you, whew, what a calculator. Test taking feels like one of the most stressful things we do in life. And you can get really, really stressed out on a stressful test if you encounter a question that you just know you know the answer to, and yet... Incorrect. You get it wrong anyway. This happened a few decades ago at the exact same time to hundreds of thousands of students all on the very same test. Do you think you can do any better? What's that? No, it's not your fault. It's fine. It's never your fault. Now entering the facility. In 1982, millions of students across the United States were preparing to take the SAT, a standardized test that's very important for college admissions. If you're not familiar, it's a fairly rigorous assessment of reading, writing, and arithmetic that weighs heavily upon the souls of students looking to get into a good college or university. But in 1982, in the math portion of one of the test versions, as reported by math books and YouTube videos with millions of views, they encountered this specific problem, which reads, <coughs> Imagine two circles, circle A and circle B. Circle A and B are touching, but circle A has one third the radius of circle B. Now imagine circle A traveling all the way around circle B once. How many times does circle A revolve? Now, if you've taken high school mathematics, you should be able to take a crack at this question. So why don't you take a crack at this question? Just grab your own TI-89 titanium minimum. <gasps> Mine still turns on from college. I didn't script this part. And give it a shot. I'm going to I'm going to be here and oh, I still got I still got my stuff on it. Oh, shush, 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 oh, shush, shush, what's that? No, it's not your fault. Oh, shush, what? No, it's never your fault. I'm the one pressing the button. Oh, hey, Arya didn't tell me how long she was gonna give you to take, what answer did you get? Well, if you're like me, you got the answer as three, or choice B, and you may have even then confidently tweeted about it at somebody. Oh, look at me, it's three, by the way, look at my hair, blah, blah, blah. But in fact, three is not the correct answer. And it's not just me who got it wrong, not a single one of 300,000 students that encountered this problem got this question right. How is that possible? Well, it turns out that the correct answer to this problem wasn't even on the test. A bit anticlimactic, I know, but before we figure out what the right answer is and should be, I got a problem with this problem. This famous question, as depicted in the most popular videos about it, is deceptively ambiguous. Think about it. What does one revolution in this case really mean? Does it mean how many times we count the letter A in circle A returning to the orientation we usually see the letter A in? <gasps> or does it mean considering the coin's perspective and asking ourselves how many times would the coin say it revolved around? Different interpretations here will lead to different answers. So, let's do the math. If one circle is gonna roll against another, their circumferences are gonna be interacting. A circle's circumference is pi times its diameter, and diameter is twice the radius. So, what is each circle's circumference going to be in terms of the radius if the radius of circle B is always gonna be three times larger? Doing the digits and canceling out terms, we find that the circumference of circle B is also gonna be three times larger than A's, and so to travel all the way around the circle, circle A must then revolve through three of its circumference, or three times. But I just said that three isn't the right answer, so what's going on? This is the ambiguity problem I mentioned before. Maybe instead of tracking circumferences, we instead need to track the orientation of circle A from our point of view, which would mean tracking the center of circle A, so that's how letter A inside of it revolves. Well, if we want to do that, yes, I am doing all this on a TI-89 titanium, fantastic calculator. Well, if we want to do the math on this, we could trace out the new circle that the center of circle A makes. The radius of this new circle 
would be the radius of circle A plus the radius of circle B. Now, if we do the digits and the math again, like we did before with this new information, <laughs> what am I? What am I, what am I, Khan Academy in here? If we do this math again, we get four. And indeed, four is the correct answer to the original SAT question. But this just seems deliberately confusing. Why would such a poorly worded question be on such an important test? There is a lot more mathematics to unpack here that we don't have time to, but I at least want to give you some additional circle mathematics that you can see at home with your very eyes. Now, as you can see on the screen behind me, if you trace out the line a point on a circle makes as it revolves around another equally sized circle, you get a lovely little heart shape called a cardioid like a heart. Now it just so happens that if you take something that moves in straight lines, like light, and you reflect that off the inside of a circle, you can get a cardioid too. Watch this. Take your phone's flashlight and shine it inside of the cup. Do you see the cardioid that forms? Light rays are bouncing all around, but there is some boundary where many of the rays of light are tangent, where they touch but don't pass. This boundary, where light bunches up, so to speak, and gets brighter, creates what's called a caustic, and it forms as long as you shine light from the edge of the coffee cup towards the inside. A caustic is a very complicated mathematical concept, to be sure, but you may not know that you're already familiar with definitely the most beautiful example you can find, a certain optic that happens when you shine sunlight through droplets of water sprinkled through the air. That's right, a rainbow is another example of a caustic. Rainbows, coins, coffee cups, mathematics, it's everywhere. There's, there's nothing in it. To find out why such a poorly worded question would be on such a critical assessment of students, like any good seeker of the truth, we should go back to the source. Now, at the time in 1982, this test mistake was big news. 300,000 test scores had to be recalculated. It was such big news that the New York Times picked it up. In the New York Times article, which you are seeing now, they say pretty much everything we've said so far, except for one big change. It printed the question from nearly 40 years ago in full, and the original question says, after how many revolutions will the center of circle A reach its starting point? The center of circle A. We just did that math, and we understand the answer. You know, it's almost, it's almost like the makers of popular math books and YouTube videos on this same question <laughs> made a mistake by not including the original question in its entirety, thereby making the video itself almost deliberately misleading for the viewer as to how tricky the actual question really is for views. Imagine that. Let's check our answers anyway. I'm gonna use a handy online tool I found to make things easier. I have set the radii to their appropriate ratio. Let's focus on the center of the smaller circle first and see how many times the radius dimension there, the line, points to the left, the equivalent of the letter A going back to its starting position. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, four, see? Okay, this time we're gonna focus in on the coin's perspective and count how many times the dot on the edge of the smaller circle touches the larger circle's surface. Here we go. One. Two. Three, see, the same situation has two different answers when the question is not properly specified. You see, by not including the original question in full, the popular retellings of this problem make the problem much harder than it ever actually was by allowing readers and viewers to fall prey to what's called the coin rotation paradox. The coin rotation paradox is a counterintuitive conundrum similar to this SAT question that you can perform at home. All you need are two equally sized coins. I'm using quarters here because I'm stupid rich. So here's the question I'm presenting to you with my very veiny hands. How many revolutions will one coin make around the other? Well, your brain reflexively tells you just one because the circumferences are the same. But let's watch Washington's nose here. Let's see it when it's in the same orientation facing this way that it is now. Carefully 
to minimize slipping as best you can. There you go, one revolution and it's in the same orientation. So to complete it, the essence of this coin paradox is that even though the circumferences are the same, no slipping, that, that, no slipping, even though the circumferences are the same, it takes two full revolutions. This result does seem odd at first, but it's the same as tracking the center of circle A as it travels around circle B, and we know and understand that math already. Now, let's track a spot on the coin's edge. When does Washington's nose touch the right side of the coin again? Let's try it from its own perspective. Minimize slipping. Perfect. Per perfect. Abs absolutely perfect. I think you see where this is going. If you do it right, there, it only takes one revolution. Just one. The coin rotation paradox isn't really a paradox, of course, it's just a result that goes against our knee-jerk reasoning because of a lack of specificity, and our brains just naturally default to one point of view, our own, over another. I think it's kind of ironic that popular retellings of this SAT question fall prey to the very same illusion that makes this question so hard in the first place. Just goes to show you, it pays to do your homework. Time's up. Please turn in your tests. Wish me luck. Until next time. So if supernova B explodes next to zeta B with a velocity of... Don't worry about it. Now exiting the facility. Thank you so much to the very nerdy staff at the facility for their direct and substantial support in creating this video. Today, especially, I want to call out research assistant Twilight Katana and visiting scholar Robert Blackburn. If you want to join the facility right now and get yourself a nice sweet lab coat and join us, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill. Join the Patreon and the Discord where right now over 1,100 nerds are giving me episode ideas, seeing merch ideas early, getting episodes early, and organizing their own game nights, coming up with canon, giving me episode ideas. It's great. And if you support the facility just enough, you get your name on Aria here each week. And as you can see, there's... <laughs> There's more and more of you, so I don't know how to pass the... If it sounded like I was calling out people who make these kind of trite math books and perhaps YouTube videos that aren't as specific as they can be, that's because I am. I'm calling them out. Specificity matters. You can't just have one or seven or 20,000. 20,000 what? You must be specific. That's how we learn. That's how we catalog things. And you know who taught me this? TI-89. TI-89, and this is true, is the only person's name that I remember from college. I literally cannot remember a single person's name. That's where my head's at. From all of us here at the facility, thanks for watching. That's right, I sound like this. I'm a calculator. <laughs>